Uh, Julian, you're on. How are you today? I'm doing great. And uh, thank you so much, Michael, for uh, having us. It's uh, super exciting. And we actually have a really exciting uh, presentation for you as well. Now, we're That's gonna awesome. I'm looking, gonna I'm looking forward to it. Um, Julian, I'm going to ask Jeffrey to uh, project. I'm going to stop sharing. And if he can put up your presentation, that would be great. Yeah. And Jeff's going to give a few minutes introduction of the group. He's been with the firm now for uh, 15 years. And uh, then uh, I'll get into the fund that I, uh, I manage it and trust. So I'm going to, I'm going to hand it over to Jeff and then you'll, you'll see me back uh, pretty soon. Awesome. Jeff, if you can uh, go into a uh, full slideshow, that would be great. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to do that in just a second, Michael. Um, but thanks for having us on. Um, I'm just going to be pretty brief in the introduction. I'll hand it over to Julian. Uh, but my name is Jeff Chan. I'm a Senior Managing Director at Entrust Global, uh, where I work on a number of strategies, including Blue Ocean for Impact, which we'll be discussing today. Entrust is a $19 billion asset manager headquartered in New York and London. And Entrust, we've been focused uh, we have a team that's been focused on investing in the maritime space for the past five years. Uh, and we currently have approximately 2 billion in capital committed. This team is known as the Blue Ocean Group and virtually the entire team have spent their entire careers focused on the maritime and transport space. Four more senior members average 22 years of experience in the sector, which includes Sven Eng, who runs the group with 33 years of experience and Julian Proctor, who's with me today, the co-portfolio manager of Blue Ocean for Impact with 23 years of experience um, I don't think you're going to find a team, quite frankly, in the investment management industry that has the maritime experience that our team has, which is very critical to the space. And that includes deep industry knowledge, extensive deal sourcing and structuring experience, and includes strong financial relationships. And most importantly, for Blue Ocean for Impact, uh, which we're discussing today, it really uh, also includes extensive experience building and monetizing maritime leasing uh, businesses. So what is Blue Ocean for Impact? Blue Ocean for Impact is a maritime leasing company we're building where we will acquire environmentally advanced maritime assets across the ocean industries, such as um, <clears throat> industrial vessels like container ships, bulk carriers, ferries, offshore wind support vessels, as well as other floating equipment that is critical to keeping the global supply chain and the global economy moving. These assets will be leased on long-term contracts talking seven to 10 years plus to large end users with a need for that equipment. Maritime transport is roughly, uh, is responsible for roughly 90% of the movement of all global goods. So it's a massive, massive industry. And as a result, maritime transport is responsible for roughly 3% of global CO2 emissions that's causing global warming, as well as other pollutants. If this industry were a country, it would rank fifth as, as the fifth largest CO2 emitter in the world ahead of Germany. That's how big it is. Um, because we're focusing on environmentally advanced maritime equipment that is lower carbon than conventional equipment today and eventually will be zero carbon down the road, our business will make an immediate and measurable impact in terms of CO2 emissions reduction, which will only increase over time. From a financial and uh, returns perspective, overall, we're looking to generate a 20% net IRR. Roughly half of this return will come from lease payments which are steady, predictable, and most importantly, negotiated up front before we acquire an asset. Um, a portion of those lease payments, the cash flow coming from those lease payments will be paid out to investors in dividends, and the balance will come, uh, the balance will be reinvested to grow the fleet. The other half will come from building a large portfolio of lease assets. We expect roughly 60 assets uh, after about seven years time. And by growing to this side, we can drive down our cost of capital to enhance returns, and after roughly seven years, we're gonna to look to exit the business through an IPO or trade sale. So um, we believe a leasing business with a diversified portfolio of cash generating assets from long-term contracts will be very attractive to investors. And we've seen many similar businesses acquire at attractive prices. Uh, because of our environmental impact, investors we've been talking to see this strategy as a way to capitalize on opportunities presented by climate change which we all know is a real uh, opportunity in portfolios today. Uh, and just as importantly, as a hedge to the climate change related risks in their portfolio. And we've certainly seen uh, a lot of companies, especially in the legacy fossil fuel space, write down their balance sheets pretty materially 
over the last six months or so. So it really um, highlights the risks in the portfolios uh, as we move to a lower carbon future. Uh, but because of our stable cash flow generation profile, the dividend, the hard asset collateral, and the, ex and the exit strategy, investors tend to view this as fitting either within their infrastructure allocation or their private equity allocation. And many investors are actually viewing it as a hybrid of both. Today, we have uh, $210 million in commitments, and we are looking to raise uh, a total of $2 billion by the end of 2021. So with that introduction, I'm going to pass it back to Julian, uh, the portfolio manager of Blue Ocean Free Impact. He's going to talk in more detail about what is driving this opportunity and how we intend to capitalize on it from both an environmental impact perspective as well as a financial perspective. Julian. And, and thanks, Jeff. And just by, by background, uh, for the last uh, 25 or so years, I've been building leasing companies um, some of the biggest leasing companies, including some which are north in Canada, C-SPAN is the world's largest, uh, and a number of other ones, including GCI, Great Horse. I spent 20 years in Asia, which really is where a large part of the, the growth in the ocean industries is. It's a really important part of it. It's where the ships are built. It's where uh, uh, a large amount of the cargo flows have increasingly come from. And what I um, just, as as a side, as a, as a story for everybody here. Some of the things that I began to notice over the last five years is that the, um, the business has fundamentally changed. Maybe, maybe Jeff, we can go to the next page. That'll be, that'll be great. Thank you so much. Um, the business has fundamentally changed. You know, when I started build, building this, there was no appreciation for climate uh, pollution in the industry. And over the last five years, that's dramatically changed. The, uh, uh, you had Paris Agreement, and Paris Agreement became a really important part of everything that shapes the, the supply chains going forward. You, you, when you think about it, what you buy at Walmart, that ultimately comes on a truck which or on an airplane, and the truck takes it from a ship, which comes from a factory somewhere else in the world, probably. And they will make emissions. And the, the, the Amazons and the Walmarts, they, they slowly started to realize that a lot of those pollutants, those externalities, which they were responsible for, they had to start to internalize them. And that's because they were under pressure from ultimately their shareholders and, and people like you and I, which would go to a, to a Walmart or if you're in Europe, you go to an Ikea to buy your goods. And that, that was a fundamental changing point because when uh, the big, uh, and users, the, the Amazons, the Walmarts, the Nikes of the world began to pivot. You had some real pressures which started to seep through the, the supply chain. And, and you've really begun to see that, right? So you're probably familiar that Amazon just uh, uh, entered into a fuel purchase program in the aviation business. They, they acquired about 6 million liters of, of biofuels, right? Because it's, this is a really important issue for them. They're looking to solve this, um, this, this carbon, this pollution issue. And likewise, these big end users, these, these, these Walmarts, the Amazons, they're also putting pressure on the logistics companies. And these logistics companies, they may be companies you're not so familiar with, people like Mars Lines, which is a really big logistics company. But fundamentally, uh, they, they, they're, they're, they're companies which we lease our ships to. We're a ship lessor. That's what we do. We buy ships, we lease the ships to these big logistics companies, which are increasingly under pressure from the, the Amazons of the world. And uh, uh, that's important because it means they're saying, no, we don't want to have any more high carbon transportation. We want to have low carbon transportation. And that means low carbon shipping. It means low carbon aviation. It means low carbon trucking. Now, the challenge is that there's just too few low carbon ships worldwide. Everything's high carbon. It's, it's using the old technology from the 1970s, from the 1980s, technology which is responsible for an, a, a billion tons of carbon emissions every year. And based on current trajectories, it'll be somewhere in the region of about 3 billion tons of CO2 by 2050, which is a huge amount. So a lot's got to be done to address that, that pollution now. And what our business does is directly address that issue, which is we invest in the lowest carbon ships, 
which will dramatically reduce that carbon footprint, which is ultimately what the customers want. That's what they're demanding. And that's why we're doing it. So you've got these customer pressures, you've got this regulatory pressure, which is Paris, and then beyond Paris in 2000, and, uh, and in fact this year, 2020, the, uh, the European Union, and I think Jeff, maybe we just stick on the, on the first slide, those, those four reasons, we can kind of go through them. That, that's great, thank you. Um, the, uh, we had, we had um, the Paris Agreement, and after the Paris Agreement, we had the, the European Union, which just came out and said, we're gonna reduce carbon emissions 55%, Shipping is involved as well, and we're going to price shipping companies that pollute. There's going to be a carbon tax. So now you've also got the regulatory environment, both the United Nations, as well as regional regulators, and California is doing a, a huge amount of work on this as well, with the Saab, the Carb is the right pronunciation. And, and ultimately, this is all conspiring together to mean that the, the shipping companies that pollute, they're going to have to exit. Because it's going to be expensive for them to, to operate in the future. They're going to be paying carbon taxes, and the customers aren't going to be demanding the, the services that they provide, which is high carbon ship freight services. There's not going to be any interest for that. So they're going to exit. And that's going to mean that the low carbon shippers, people like us, ship owners, we're going to have an increasingly attractive de demand environment. Few ships, growing demand. And that's a very, very attractive macro environment. There's two other reasons which are really important to think about, right? And this relates to the flow of money, and the and, and money flows are so important. We're, we're a huge industry. We're, a, we're a, a several trillion dollars in terms of the capital assets in uh, in the maritime industry, in the ocean industry. And the um, the capital flows are incredibly favorable for us because we're a lessor. We buy the assets, we lease the assets. The banks. And we use a lot of leverage. Think about it just in the same way you would buy a house with 30% equity, you borrow 70% from the debt from the banks, and you would lease these, uh, uh, not to tenants, but to these big end user companies, so these, these Musks, maybe the, the uh, Exxon Mobiles of the world, super high quality end users, right? The banks, they want to lend to businesses like ours because ultimately we've got green assets and, you've, and you're probably very aware that there's a big push away from fossil and there's a big pull towards green. We're a net recipient of that because we've got low carbon shifts. We don't have high carbon shifts. So the banks want to lend to businesses like ours, and they do it at increasingly favorable rates. There's also the, the flip side, which is, uh, which is frankly the opportunity for us, which makes it highly profitable. The amount of equity which has been in the business has been shrinking over the years. And, and that's largely a, a function of the fact that uh, Five or six years ago, as you'll probably all remember, there was a, a commodity super cycle, at least there was the belief there was a commodity super cycle, that China was going to continue to buy all the commodities in the world and uh, commodity prices will continue to go up. And many private equity and hedge fund investors, they invested in, in shipping. But they were speculators, they were gamblers, and they lost because ultimately... Uh, commodity prices, we know what happened they, in 2014, Q4, 2015, Q1, they all fell over, right? And many of those gamblers, they lost money. As a consequence, the amount of equity which has gone into this business has reduced. There's a gap, right? And this decarbonization of the industry, of the, the, the entire maritime industry, is going to take a lot of capital. It's going to take trillions of dollars of new capital to build out the new assets, these no, those new low-carbon assets. But where's the equity going to come from? It's scarce. And that's what we try to solve. We try to solve a, it's a real problem. It's a problem that there's a lack of equity and there's a lack of equity to, to ultimately uh, build these low carbon ships, which are super important to address this climate challenge, but it's really profitable because when you think about it, it all conspires. Low carbon ships means you're burning less fuel. You're burning cheaper fuel. It's, it, it's more competitive. So it means that your business gets better. The more you um, focus on solving the carbon issue, because it's all about the, the amount of fuel that you're ultimately using, the more competitive your, uh, your operating costs. And that's a really important factor because it means you are completely aligned when you're solving the climate problem with profitability. It means you've got a better business. And that's ultimately what we're really, really focused on. Plugging that equity hole, building a great leasing company, which is highly diverse, I suppose, uh, uh, traditional shipping that you'll probably all be well aware of in this call, 
the container ships, the tankers, the dry bulk vessels, which move various types of commodities around the world, but also offshore wind. And you've probably seen on the east coast of America, there'll be about 30 gigawatts of new offshore wind parks. We'll, we'll be owning uh, some of the vessels which help maintain those wind farms. We'll be doing that in Europe as well. And there's going to be about 140 gigawatts built in Europe. This is a big, big growth opportunity in terms of renewable energy. And it's something which we're, we, uh, we think is uh, incredibly exciting because we're right at the beginning of that, um, of that, uh, uh, that growth pattern. We're also going to look at ferries. Ferries is, is a super important part. This is critical maritime infrastructure. It's, it, 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 ser it, it, it serves a particular purpose in particular cities or particular uh, ferry routes. And the cash flows are incredibly stable as well. So as you can see, we have these really granular, diverse portfolios with multiple industry sectors, with multiple types of customers. And as we get scale, as we get scale, it means our risk continues to reduce. And that means we attract lower and lower cost of capital. And that goes to equity. All that value goes to equity, right? And I've done this many times before. I've built some business and taken those businesses public on this exact same basis where we'll build at a, at a, at a, at a, at a, at a private multiple, an attractive private multiple, and we'll ultimately then sell the business on a much more attractive public multiple. And we've done that in the, in the public markets. We've also done in the trade sale markets. So we think it's an incredibly attractive and uh, compelling uh, opportunity. Maybe um, Jeff will just uh, go forward to uh, the, the nice technology page that we have, which, and this is really, thanks Jeff, and this is really at the heart of everything that we do, right? Which is when we build these, these low carbon ships and we'll build them worldwide, the, the ships we use in America, we'll do that at American yards. The sh some of the ships that we utilize for the offshore wind in Europe, we're gonna, be, we're gonna do that in European yards. Some of the more traditional ships we're going to build in uh, uh, some Asian yards, and that could be Japan, it could be Korea, it could be uh, uh, sometimes China. But the key thing is we're investing in uh, technology propulsion systems, which are absolutely uh, uh, cutting edge. They are they're low carbon. They have phenomenal environmental properties in reducing carbon emissions. But also what's super important is we have a really clear path forward to increasingly low carbon and zero emission fuels, right? And that's because we maximize the optionality in the engine systems of the ships that we own. And this is important because the, uh, the customer pressures are only going to increase. Amazon's not going to stop. They're going to, they've already come out saying we're going to be zero emissions in the mid 2030s. So they have to have suppliers. Remember that supply chain, they need to have people in that supply chain, which can match up with what they want. That doesn't exist today. We're trying to build that. So we need to continually be able to provide the lowest emission systems that you can do. And we're starting with a clean balance sheet, with a clean sheet, with the most advanced vessels. We're going to be better positioned than anybody else to achieve this. Because we're going to have the optionality, that means we can switch to these lower carbon, zero emission vessels in the future at the lowest possible cost, which is a really attractive proposition to have. Because there's going to be many people which uh, uh, own ships today, they're going to have stranded assets. There's going to be a lot of value risks that they assume. And, and frankly, that's a really attractive proposition to us because it means they're going to exit the industry. Because their cost of capital is going to rise, money's not going to flow to those guys, and they're going to find that ultimately they're going to have impaired asset risks. And that's, again, going to ultimately help the, the fundamentals of this market to, uh, to underpin the, the, the returns that we're, which we're going to achieve. So with that, I, um, I'm going to just pause there for a minute to open up to questions because I'm mindful of time and, I, and I've spoken a lot. And this is a, it's a really important uh, uh, topic. We're building a great business. So I'm going to open it up, Michael, to, the, uh, to, the, to those on the call here. So Julian, we have a question. Um, this was sent to me by email. Um, they are looking for... Um, you know, a bull, a beer, and a, a base case on the returns for this type of a strategy. Right. And, that, and, and when you think about it, everything that we do is being underwritten to a very robust business model, right? If you think about what we have, we end up with a portfolio of uh, the best quality assets in terms of vessels, marine, marine, marine assets, which have got these long-term contracts to... Uh, uh, the best possible companies, governments as well. You know, we're looking at some ferry deals now, which have got concessions with the European 
governments, right, or provinces. So we've got these really stable cash flows, and from those stable cash flows, you can generate dividends, which, uh, depending on how you view dividends, uh, that underwrites a large part of your return. So if, if, if all that we were to do was build this business, have a great portfolio, run the cash flows, we'd be generating uh, net IRRs of uh, around about 10%, right? Which is, when you're in an environment when you're getting 0% or negative in the, in, the, in, the, in the checking account, that's a great return on its own, right? And, and, and the risk is, uh, is frankly a lot less because inflation is going to kill you if you keep your money in, in, in the bank account. Whereas here, you're in real assets, which you're going to be constantly benefiting from inflation and generating a return. So, so frankly, that, that's attractive. The, the up case is when you build a scale, when you build the, the, the platform, which you can then ultimately do incredibly attractive things with it. You can sell it to a big trade buyer. Uh, I'm involved in, in, in many big M&A deals where uh, many Asian buyers been willing and wanting to pay a very high price for uh, what they will view as the leading franchise. We're building the leading franchise. And you've also got the public markets. And there's a long, um, uh, as you probably know, Michael, uh, the, the, the IPO markets are absolutely white hot for anything which is green. And we are, we're, we're not a greenwashing business. We are a very deep impact business, right? So more and more money is moving towards the public markets. Uh, they want to uh, acquire uh, businesses like this. And that pushes up, pushes up valuations and pushes down uh, equity. So the, the opportunity that you have in this business is really attractive. We've got uh, great downside protection because of the contracts, because of the, the, the hard assets, or those stable cash flows, which is underwriting that, that 10% business. But we've got this great optionality that as we build a scale, we can, we can look to try and achieve those, those much higher returns, those 20% 20, 20 plus returns. So I, I think it's incredibly compelling. Okay, we got a, We have another question here um, that they, they said, because you consider this a, a hybrid e, ESG play, how, how should somebody looking for that exposure look at this particular investment? So I really want to say ESG, right? We're not ESG. I mean, ESG, there's a whole bunch of guys who say the ESG, and all you got to do is look at all the public stocks and uh, they, they, they're not actually doing anything, right? What we are doing is we are a deep impact business, which is we solve a particular, a really big issue, and that's the environment, right? And what we do is we we actually own a business which which does the reduction of the carbon emissions, right? And it's so important for people to understand we solve a problem. We solve a big environmental problem. A lot of the ESG companies that you hear about, they don't do that. They just they have a, um, a policy or they have a procedure, right? They may have uh, uh, they might discuss it on the board now and again. But we actually have a business model which solves a material environmental challenge. And that's why it's attractive. You look at the guys which are doing super well right now and getting priced in the markets today. It's people who are building hydrogen electrolyzers, people which are involved in uh, technology, which reduces emissions, which produce better combustion engine systems, which are involved in the electrification of the economy. These are the businesses that people want because they actually solve a problem. And that's what we're doing. We solve the problem by, by owning the assets which will reduce carbon emissions in the supply chain. Just to add to that, um, the, the impact portion is obviously an integral part of our business model and a benefit of our business model. But just to make clear, when we talk about hybrid from an asset class perspective, we're really talking about a hybrid between private equity and infrastructure because the cash flows, the long-term cash flows that Julian was referencing, which again is critical to making the investment in an underlying vessel in the first place. So those cash flows are known up front. Those are long-term cash flows uh, that provide that predictable that um, that predictable stream of income with hard assets, which makes it look very much like in the infrastructure. And we're talking about generating a ten percent IRR based on those cash flows alone. Um, so that makes it very attractive for investors who are looking at this as part of their infrastructure play. Because at the end of the day, what we're doing is decarbonizing transport and the supply chain. And then, and when you think of our exit the 20% plus that comes from the IPO of this business. So uh, obviously that's more of a private equity component to that. So 
when we're talking about hy uh, hybrid, it's not necessarily as it relates to ESG and more accurately impact. It's more as it relates to what do our cash flows look like and what do our ultimate exit look like? We think it has the positive attributes of both infrastructure, long-term cash flows, hard assets backing that, and private equity in terms of the additional return we're able to generate by building this large leasing business. Got you, got you. So can you guys give like a time a timeline? How long uh, you expect on the, the lockup for the money? And, um, you know, what, what your thoughts are around that? And then t talk about uh, the fund launch and what your plans are uh, for this particular fund launch. Yeah, sure. Ooh. So from a from a capital raising and timing perspective, as I mentioned earlier, we've secured our initial uh, seed investor, a large sovereign wealth fund who is committed to 210 million. That is signed. Docs are in. Julian and the rest of the team are actively sourcing potential transactions as we speak. Um, and we are looking to raise the remainder of our initial $2 billion of capital uh, by the end of 2021. Um, conversations around the globe are ongoing, and uh, those conversations have been very positive. Obviously, COVID has slowed things down from a due diligence perspective uh, somewhat, um, but the, uh, I, I would say the pipeline is very strong from that perspective. Um, in terms of the lockup, and this goes back to the whole hybrid comment and the fund structure comment, um, it looks more like private equity. This is obviously a business where investors, the investment that the investors will hold will be in the equity interests in this company. And they can do that two, way, the, uh, two ways. The vast majority of our investors will invest through a traditional um, fund, fund structure. And that fund, its only holding will be the equity interests in Blue Ocean for Impact, the operating company. Obviously, once the operating company is ultimately monetized, uh, those cash flows will come back into the feeder fund and back to the investors. Uh, for certain very large investors, uh, you know, think about the large sovereign wealth, uh, et cetera, they may be able to make direct private equity investments and hold those interests directly. Um, from a lockup perspective, it looks more like infrastructure in the sense that, in the sense that these are very long life assets. Uh, there is no hard date per se, like private equity, where we're saying this is a seven year fund. The reason for that is the Julian's earlier comments on kind of, you know, some of the speculators that were in this space before, um, we're, we're not looking to be in a situation where we need to wind down this business just because there's an arbitrary fund date. Uh, we think that ultimately hurts um, the business uh, from a monetization standpoint, but very importantly, our incentives are in line in that our incentives are structured that we don't really get paid uh, the bulk of our compensation comes from the monetization of the business. So we're, we're not incentivized to hold this uh, business into perpetuity. As we get into 10 years plus, um, there are increasing transfer rights available to LPs. Um, that's pretty standard, I believe, uh, as an in infrastructure investors. But our base case is to IPO and monetize this business in roughly seven years. Yeah, Michael, just to practically in terms of... Um, having done this now for 25 years, the, you look at guys who've done it well and guys who haven't done it well, right? And the guys who've done it well, uh, they've always had the ability to say, let's wait another day, right? Maybe today is not the best day to do it, to exit. And the guys who made the mistakes, the guys who ultimately, um, they had pressure to sell and the market knew it. I mean, everybody knows when you, there's, there's somebody who has to sell. It's the worst kept secret, right? So you need to make sure that even, and, and uh, you know, Jeff said it well, we're incentivized to do it. Even though you're going to exit, we would hope in six, seven years out, and we've exited earlier and many times before, you've got to make sure that everybody knows you've got staying power and you've got capital to do it. Because when you've got capital and you've got duration, that it gives you phenomenal strength. So guys, that that's uh, you you laid out a very very intriguing case. I have a bunch of people that are asking for a copy of the the presentation. Um, if you don't have um, like, do you guys share this with people, or is this something that um, 
you, it's, it's not for public consumption. Yeah, absolutely. We're more than happy to share the presentation material, uh, Michael, yeah. as, as you would imagine, there is compliance around that. Uh, so uh, we can work with you um, to uh, understand um, uh, the individuals or institutions asking for the materials, which we're more than happy to share. We just have to go through the compliance, but that's not an issue. Yeah, and, okay. and the good news is we have uh, uh, Mark, uh, as you know, on the phone, Michael. So uh, I think Mark and Jeff are in a great position to do that. So, Mark, do you want to do you want to quickly uh, introduce yourself? Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Yes. Hi. So this is Mark Warlia, uh, managing director of business development. Uh, I've been uh, I, I've known Michael now for uh, it's probably going on three years now, Michael. So um, anyone who's interested in learning more, um, Michael, maybe you and I can work together and uh, and certainly get people, you know, the information needed, set up side calls, wh whatever people are interested in, uh, uh, how to approach it. We're here to help. All right, guys, I, I appreciate your time, taking the time, introducing uh, this concept and opportunity. And I love, you know, the differentiation impact, impact investment. So you, you're actually doing good. Uh, you get a steady IRR through the cash flows and upside exit potential through an IPO at the, at the right time. Or a um, trade sale, Michael, but you said it I well. I like it. I like it, guys. Thank you. All right. And thank you, you Michael. Happy, happy holidays. Yeah. Happy holidays, Michael. All thank right. you, Michael. To you and everybody on the phone. Thank you. All right. Thank you guys.